Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Seth Monahan, and it is finally time for us to spend a few videos talking about musical sequences. Starting today with the most basic question, which is, what are they? Uh, and we're going to turn to Mozart for help with this. This is a passage from one of the piano concertos, and when I play it, pay attention to the melody, and specifically ask yourself how the melody is built in the top system. So, if we pare things down to just the outer voices, two things should be really clear. One is that the bass is just a dominant pedal, and two, the melody is built from repetitions of a one-bar motive. But not random repetitions. Every instance of the motive is exactly one step higher than the last one. And as it happens, we know from historical documents that Mozart wrote this whole passage simply by copying and pasting that motive from one bar to the next. <laughs> and it was in that fever of inspiration that Mozart made what we call a sequence. So let's get a definition on screen. To make a sequence, you take some musical thing, a motive, a chord progression, a whole contrapuntal texture, and then you repeat it at a new pitch level. Maybe higher, maybe lower, maybe once, maybe more than once. But if you repeat it more than once, it has to move in the same direction by the same interval. That's what Mozart did here. He took a melodic motive and moved it up by step three times. That's a sequence. And it turns out, within the sequence, we have special names for the different instances of the motive. The first one is called the model, and then the rest of them are called copies. So every sequence will have a model and at least one copy. Many have more than one copy. This one has three. Another thing you need to know, and this is really just common sense, is that composers are usually going to build sequences so that they stay in or near the key they started in. That means when we're measuring distances, we're going to be talking about generic interval sizes rather than specific ones. In other words, we say Mozart's sequence goes up by step, not by half step or by whole step, because obviously it uses both. Without even thinking about it, Mozart's just going to do whatever is necessary to keep the sequence on the white keys of the piano. But if, if for whatever reason he forgot to do that, or maybe he forgot how to do that, it would be complete anarchy. Imagine Mozart, you know, like, falls off his bike, hits his head, and suddenly decides that the copies in this sequence should all have exactly the same intervals as the model. The result would sound like this. Which definitely gets you burned at the stake in 1784, so please, wear a helmet, and if you're writing a sequence, stay in the key, like this. So the second example I've got for you today is from Bach's E major French suite, and it contrasts nicely with the Mozart in several ways. It has one extra copy, four versus three. It's obviously in the bass voice rather than the melody. It goes down by third rather than up by step, and it modulates. The excerpt starts with a PAC in F sharp minor, and then immediately winds its way back into the tonic E through the dominant. But despite their differences, this sequence has one really important thing in common with the Mozart. The sequence itself is in a single voice. On that basis, it's what we call a melodic sequence. These happen all the time, and they are true sequences, but they're not actually going to be what we focus on here or in later videos. Because when people talk about sequences, they're usually referring to what are called harmonic sequences, and that's a real topic here. So what are they? Well, everything we just learned about melodic sequences is still true. There's going to be a model and then one or more copies, all separated by the same interval, but now the model is not just some isolated event, some little snippet of melody. Now the model is going to be the entire musical texture. In other words, 
in harmonic sequences, you build a passage by copying and pasting everything. Let me show you. These are the first two bars of the trio from Haydn's second Opus 20 string quartet, and he uses them as the model for a harmonic sequence with two and a half copies. Now, if I happen to know that the sequence also descends by step, I don't even need to see it to know literally every single thing that's going to happen in the music for the next few bars. It's going to do this, and take it down by step. It's going to do that again, take it down by step, and then roughly half of it is repeated down once more by step. And in fact, that is literally what Haydn wrote. So you can see, once the sequential pattern gets going, it takes over everything that's happening in the music. And the result is a certain kind of satisfying predictability. Now, if that sounded familiar, it's no coincidence. This happens to be the most common type of sequence there is, and you're going to learn a lot more about it in video 40. For now, though, I want to stick with more general observations, like the fact that harmonic sequences require us to think about, big surprise, harmony. And the most important thing you need to know is that harmonic sequences play by different rules than run-of-the-mill functional harmony. Think about it. If you're working with a model that contains chords, each subsequent copy is also going to contain chords. And the result is that the overall progression is generated by the sequence itself. So let me show you what I mean. Haydn's model here contains two chords, which is totally typical. That's the norm. They happen to be root position tonic and 4-6-5. Well, since we know that the next two bars are the very same music down a whole step, we know what the Roman numerals will be without even analyzing. Each of them is just one, you know, Roman numeral lower. A step below 4-6-5 is going to be 3-6-5, and a step below root position tonic is root position subtonic. And then we do all that again. A step below subtonic is root position 6, step below 3-6-5 is 2-6-5, and then step down again from root position 6 to root position 5. So how then does this progression, generated by the sequence, square with what we know about functional harmony? Well, we're going to start by changing that big Roman numeral 7 to a 5 of 3, and if you don't know why I did that, go check out video 33. But with that done, it's actually possible to tease out a sort of coherent series of harmonic functions here, at least hypothetically. But let's not breeze past this chord, 3-6-5. When we learned about 3 in minor, we saw that it had a tonic function, but that it also pretty much only appeared as a root position triad. 3-6-5 is not really a thing, except in harmonic sequences. And as it turns out, sequences contain all kinds of rare and unfamiliar chords. We don't see them elsewhere, but they sound fine because we hear them as part of the ongoing pattern. Still though, all that being said, this sequence mostly checks out where functional harmony is concerned. But watch what happens if we take this same sequence and put it in C major rather than C minor. Now this is not what Haydn wrote, but he absolutely could have written this. These are not unfamiliar sounds. Familiar sounds, but the progression here is mostly new to us, especially toward the middle. We have never seen any kind of three chord in major, let alone this three, six, five thing. Before that, we've got a seven diminished triad in root position, which we have also never seen. And since its root doesn't act like a leading tone, we can't really say that it has a dominant function here. And finally, there's root position six, a chord that carries three possible functions, but none of them apply here. So it turns out that whole stretches of sequences may just have no clear harmonic function at all. In fact, the scenario on screen is really typical of longer sequences. You'll often have functional harmony near the beginning and the end, like a kind of on-ramp and off-ramp, but then the middle does its own thing based on the logic of the sequence itself. So let's recap what we know about harmonic sequences. They're always built from a model and one or more copies. And if there's more than one copy, they'll always move in the same direction by the same interval. They might also end on a half copy. We saw that today. 
The model itself involves the complete musical texture, not just some isolated chunk of melody. And because of this, the model contains chords, usually two chords per model. That's true for most of the common sequences. And because of the copy-paste logic of sequences, we can expect to see chords and chord progressions that don't turn up elsewhere. Before we wrap up, I want to add just a few more points to this list. First, most harmonic sequences fall, I think, within three broad families, based on whether they go up or down and by what interval. I'm going to make separate videos about at least two and possibly all three of them. But there are lots of less common sequences that don't fit in these categories or fit in them eh, kind of weirdly, um, and they are not going to get their own videos. Number two, sequences tend to stay in or near the key they started in, but mild chromaticism is really common. We're going to see applied chords turning up in sequences and plenty of sequences that modulate to nearby keys. And lastly, you should know that composers aren't always especially fussy about what counts as, quote, exact repetition. In other words, something can sound and act and feel like a sequence, despite little glitches and wrinkles that make the model and copies slightly different from each other. In just a second, I'm going to play you one of my favorite sequences from Beethoven's Opus 132 String Quartet. It's a model plus one and a half copies, each a third lower than the last, and I want you to just sort of feel its sequenciness. I'll play it twice without the score. And again. Now, I hope you notice that the passage starts with a very sequential feel. It seems to check all the boxes, and it's possible to sketch out an authentic copy-paste sequence that sounds almost identical to Beethoven's. Here's the version that lives in my head that uses exact repetition. time. Now, it sounds like the Beethoven, but if you compare it to Beethoven's actual score, you see something very different. In Beethoven's original, there's actually no copying and pasting at all. The models and the copies are all slightly different from one another. The model starts on D rather than F sharp, like it, quote, should. There's a trill at the top of the texture that doesn't actually move at all. The bass line goes up here by seventh instead of down by step, because it has to. The melody here goes up an octave, although it doesn't have to at all. This G, quote, should be a B. And then the viola's inner voices on beat two change every time. But you'd have to be crazy to deny that this is a sequence. Of course it's a sequence. But I'm showing it to you so you'll have a suitably flexible idea of what counts and what doesn't count as a sequence. And this one definitely does. And for the record, folks, if you don't know the movement this passage comes from, close your browser, grab some headphones, and listen to it. Seriously. I know it's such a cliche to be a late Beethoven fanboy, but my god, this is really, really special music. And this sequence is a climax you can't really understand without taking the entire journey. So go take it. And in the meantime, I'll be working diligently on video number 40 on what some people call circle of fifth sequences. Don't miss it. Mm -hmm.